Welcome to Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. I'm Catherine Nikolai. I write and read all the stories you'll hear on the Village of Nothing Much. Audio engineering and sound design is by Bob Wittersheim. A few years ago, I was taking a fiction writing class, and I asked the professor if I could write a book about nothing. She very kindly told me that lots of people ask that, but no, not really. Stories need arcs. Characters need journeys. And hey, she's not wrong. But I was convinced that there was a way to tell stories that celebrate the small, everyday moments, the practically nothing moments, and that doing so could be hopeful and therapeutic. And when I sold my book, Nothing Much Happens, to over 30 countries, well, that professor celebrated with me. So these stories are just little jaunts into a grown-up land of make-believe. And I invite you to listen while you take a walk, or put together a puzzle, or relax somewhere cozy. Let's start just by drawing a deep breath in through the nose, and sighing from your mouth. One more, please fill it up, and flush it out. Good. Our stories today are about midwinter, the moments in it when we might need something to push us along till spring. We'll settle our minds by doing something simple with great care in little rituals. Then we'll step out into the sunshine and watch the icicles dripping from the eaves in a break in the weather. Finally, we'll wrap up in a fluffy robe and head out to the sauna, soak up the heat and make a New Year's wish in shooting stars. Little Rituals When my mother came home at the end of the day, she'd stand at a little cabinet tucked into a niche in our entryway and slowly slide the rings from her finger. She'd unclasp her watch and place all the finery into a small ceramic bowl set there just for the purpose. She worked with her hands all day, and they must have been sore. She'd massage her finger joints one by one and press the pad of her thumb into her palm, rubbing out the ache. Then she'd slide her wedding band back on, leaving the rest in the bowl to wait for her till tomorrow. She was quiet while she did this, slowly attending to her hands, and when she'd finished, she'd let out a small sigh and step into the heart of the house and join us in the listening to and telling of the stories of the day. Someone had explained to me years ago that when rituals were blindly followed, they weren't of much use. But when they had a bit of meaning tied to them, and especially when you thought about that meaning while you performed them, well then, they became tools. Tools that could help you turn the page on a moment, or celebrate, or treasure, or any number of useful human actions. When I'd learned that, I'd thought of my mother and her evening habit and the bowl on the cabinet. It had been a ritual of her own devising, a way to care for herself at the end of the workday and to shift from the world of traffic and deadlines to a world of her own with her family and home. Since then, I'd created a few rites of my own, and this afternoon I felt the need for one in particular. It was a ritual for slowing down when my brain was buzzing. When I found myself forgetting things, hustling to catch up, and feeling like I couldn't put my thoughts in order, I'd pull my tiny espresso pot down from the shelf and push up my sleeves and begin. You see, this couldn't be done in a hurry, and it took a bit of focus to be done right. So I knew it would sort out my mixed up mind. These tiny mocha pots come in a few different styles and designs. Some screw together, but mine worked with a clamp. So I unclamped the top bit from the bottom and took the small filter basket from the bottom piece. I turned on the tap and adjusted the flow quite low. It was a delicate business to get just the right amount of water into the bottom chamber, 
so that when I set the filter into it, the water just grazed its bottom. I took a canister of ground beans from the cupboard and twisted off its top. I'd left a tiny spoon stuck upright in the grounds, and I drew it out and started to spoon the coffee into the filter. I did this little by little, filling the filter slowly and using the side of the spoon to tap the grounds in. They would expand as the water boiled and the steam forced its way through them, so I didn't want the basket over full, just full enough. Then I hooked the lip of the top piece over the tiny metal knob in the bottom and turned the handle to clamp the pot back together. At the stove, I lit the smallest burner to low and set the pot on it. Now there was a bit of time to wait, and my still somewhat busy mind tried to push me back into the habit of filling every single second with tasks. But I was prepared for this. First, I stood for a moment at the stove and just rooted down into my feet and felt the way my weight was balanced over them. Then I took a slow breath in through my nose and out through my mouth. I turned to look out the window and watched a truck at the stop sign on the corner take a slow turn onto the side street. I had a small, round table under a window tucked into the corner of the kitchen, a good spot for breakfast or for opening the mail in the afternoon or for a cup of espresso right about now. I went to it and made a comfortable place for myself, setting a few books in a neat stack on the windowsill and putting a bud vase with a single blooming lily at the table center. All of this was part of the ritual. I was taking time to do something small with great care, and it signaled to me that I, as much as any other soul in the universe, deserved care. It reminded me that I wasn't a machine made to do chores, but a whole person, and that while being a whole person sometimes felt complicated and layered with many emotions, it also came with a lot of enjoyment for moments like these. I took my favorite cup from the cupboard and set it in its saucer. I didn't need one, really, but I liked the way it looked and felt in my hand, and that was enough of a reason to use it. The pot was bubbling and hissing, and it reminded me of the sound of an old radiator in a tiny apartment I'd lived in during college. I turned off the burner and smiled at the memory. I'd had this same little coffee pot back in that apartment, which had been in an old house downtown with noisy neighbors and creaking wood floors. But it had been all mine, and I'd loved it. Sometimes I'd wake in the night and I'd listen to those old radiators hissing and gurgling, and it would put me right back to sleep. I took a small spoon from the drawer and the sugar bowl down from the shelf and carefully tipped back the lid on the coffee pot. The surface of the coffee had a thin layer of bubbly foam on top, and I breathed in the rich, roasted smell. I tipped in a few spoonfuls of sugar and slowly stirred it in. It was another moment to slow down. If I went too fast, the sugar wouldn't dissolve and the cup would taste bitter. I might even knock the pot over and spill the precious coffee. I'd done it before, but I'd learned. Go slow, do the thing properly. A few crystals of sugar clung to the percolating spindle in the pot, and I spooned hot coffee over them to wash them back in with the rest. Then I closed the lid and slowly poured a cup for myself. I carried it over to the table and sat down. The ritual had worked its magic. My thoughts were smooth and sorted again, like a needle on a record player that had been set down exactly into a groove. My mind was set back into the present and I was listening to the music of it moment to moment. I lifted the cup to my lips and drank. A break in the weather. We'd had a few days of bright sun and balmy, sweet-smelling air, interrupting the ice and cold of midwinter. I'd been happily hibernating, 
buried deep in blankets and thick sweaters with a tall stack of books and endless cups of tea to see me through to spring. But when I opened the front door today and blinked up at the bright, clear skies, I felt that stir of excitement that normally comes a few more months down the line. I found myself wondering if the creek behind the library was frozen up or running fast today. I wondered if the shops downtown had changed their window displays and if there was a new movie at the theater. I decided to find out. I was so used to bundling up that I'd already stepped into my snow boots and had a scarf and hat on before I remembered that today felt different. I opened the door again and let the air move around me. I'd be overheated after a minute of walking dressed like this, so I traded my boots for sneakers and my hat and scarf for sunglasses. I stopped on my front sidewalk to look up and down the street. I heard the slam of a back door and a call to, come on, and saw that the neighborhood kids weren't wasting the day. They had scooters and bikes, which had arrived at Christmas and Hanukkah, and which they'd been hesitantly pushing around the living room floor, waiting to break them in, and today was the day. I watched as they hopped on, pushing and pedaling their way up the hill to ride it joyfully back down. I remembered that feeling of speed and rushing air on my face, and the memory spun me towards town with a spring in my step. The sidewalks were clear and dry, but the gutters ran with rivulets of melting snow. I watched the water as it moved, pulled by gravity, creased with its current, and spilling quickly into the grate at the corner. I wondered if I still knew how to make a paper boat with its cuffed hull and thin peaked sail. I had a stack of origami papers in my desk drawer at home. Maybe I would try later. As I turned the corner into town, I saw that the warm weather had called to lots of us today. The sidewalks were bustling with people out for a walk, some pushing strollers or stepping out with dogs who were happily sniffing at every tree and bench. Many walked with their coats open to the warm air and their faces tilted up to the sun. I stopped at the movie house and looked up at all their posters. I have a great love for movie posters and let the sun warm my back as I stood to read the taglines and look at the faces of the actors. They had a few vintage posters set behind panes of glass and I liked the way their frayed edges and slightly faded colors looked against the newer ones. A couple came through the doors holding hands and still laughing from whatever show they'd seen. The smell of fresh popcorn followed them out onto the street. I walked for a while, looking into shop windows and enjoying the way things smelled and sounded on the street. The creek was flowing fast in the ravine behind the library, and I stopped to watch a gray squirrel as she picked through the pine needles at the water's edge. Her broad, furry tail was pulled back over her small body and head like an umbrella, shielding her from the dripping, melting snow in the branches above. The lampposts in the park were still strung with twinkle lights, and I hoped they would be until spring truly came. The days were still short, and the long months of winter could drag, so knowing that there would be a little more light in places like this made the waiting agreeable. There was a cart on the edge of the park, and I stopped to buy a soft pretzel wrapped in wax paper, dotted with salt and smeared with yellow mustard. After one bite, I knew that the pretzel must have come from the bakery a few blocks away. Everything they made had a sort of signature flavor, and while I couldn't put my finger on what it was, I knew it when I tasted it. I stopped on a bench to eat. The dough was soft and chewy, and the salt crunched in my teeth. The bench sat across from the yoga studio, and the windows were fogged up from the class that was just letting out. I watched as the classroom doors opened and students gathered shoes and jackets. They looked a bit sweaty and had calm, happy faces. A man tucked his mat under his arm and stopped to draw a heart and the condensation on the window pane. Someone else drew a peace sign. From my bench, I looked up at the top of the building. It had a cornice of arches and carved stone in a deco design. There was an old fashioned fire escape along its side and the iron bars were thick with icicles. 
They were dripping fast in the sunshine, and the sound it made as the drops hit the cobblestones below reminded me of rain on a tin roof. On my way back through town toward home, I caught up a newspaper blowing against a tree trunk. I smoothed the page and saw it held the forecast for the next few days. A snowstorm was predicted to start late tonight and blanket our town with a thick layer of snow and ice by morning. The sun was bright and warm on my face as I read, and it didn't seem possible that we'd be back in winter in a few hours. But I thought of my stack of books, of the pot of soup I could make, and the half-done afghan I'd been crocheting, and felt excited to tuck back into my hibernation. This brief break in the weather had been energizing, and it had got me out and about on this beautiful day. But I wasn't quite done with winter yet, and it seemed from the paper in my hand that it wasn't quite done with me either. Shooting stars. There was just a bit of daylight left when I started getting all of my things in order. It was part of the ritual, in fact. There were things I did to prepare for this part of my day, and they became a way to decompress in and of themselves. First, I shoveled the path from the back door out to the patio. I'd needed a hat and coat and mittens for that. It was a cold, still afternoon. And when I scooped shovelfuls of snow from the path, I noticed that it was the powdery, dry sort that doesn't pack together into a ball. It fell like shimmering dust from my shovel. It was a good kind for skiing, I thought. But I wasn't skiing today. I was getting ready for a nice, long sit in my sauna. That was something younger me never would have thought she would do. Before I bought this house, I didn't even really know what a sauna was. Maybe I'd seen them in movies, and there was one at my gym that was perpetually closed for maintenance. In fact, I remember being taken through the house and yard by my realtor and spotting the little building tucked under the eaves and asking what on earth it was. A potting shed? A kind of clubhouse? My realtor had laughed and pushed open the door, and the smell of cedar and warm air had rolled out and wrapped around me. That may have been the moment I decided I wanted this to be my home. And now, a few years later, this was part of my routine most cold days of the year. With the path shoveled, I went inside to fix myself a big glass of water and get into my robe and towel. I took a quart-sized glass jar from the cupboard and peeked into the fruit bowl on the counter. Citrus was in season, and I had been gifted a large bag of red grapefruit at the holidays. I took one and washed its skin carefully at the sink, then sliced it into thin rounds and slid them down into my jar. It didn't change the taste, but just because I liked the way it looked, I spent a couple minutes getting the slices to stick to the inside edges of the jar so that the pretty star shape and ruby fruit showed through it. I poured in fresh water and took a few sprigs of mint from the fridge to drop into the top. Then I went upstairs and took a giant fluffy towel from the linen closet. I pressed it to my nose and breathed in the scent of clean laundry. I shed my clothes from the day and wrapped myself up in my robe, a holiday gift I'd gotten from an attentive friend who'd heard me complain about the holes in my last one. This one went all the way down to my ankles and was made with a soft waffle weave fabric. I tied the belt and stepped into my slippers and headed back downstairs. It had begun to snow again while I was getting into my robe, and I stopped at the back door with my towel and water to look out. It was fully dark now. I'd read in the paper today that shooting stars might be visible tonight, but for now the skies were crowded with low clouds. I took a deep breath and stepped out through the door. I felt the cold at my throat 
and hurried over the patio and to the sauna. The little hut was barrel-shaped and had a small window in the door. I pushed it open and was immediately surrounded by warmth. I stepped in and left my slippers on a mat inside the door. I sighed. It was an automatic reaction. There was a hook for my robe and a broad bench where I laid my towel. Before I stretched out on it, I reached for the ladle floating in a deep pail of water and spooned some onto the hot stones that heated the room. What a lovely sound that sizzle was. And the moist air felt soft as I breathed it in. Sometimes I brought a book in to read while I laid or played music through the speakers, but today I'd had enough of sounds and thinking. The most therapeutic approach for me right now was quiet and stillness. So I laid on my towel and let the heat work its way into my body. I'd had a childhood friend whose family used a sauna almost every day. It was part of their culture and seen as a necessary component to their health and hygiene. I remembered her saying that she didn't really feel clean until she'd had a good sweat. And now I understood her completely. As my body warmed up, I felt myself relaxing deeper and deeper. A soft shiver ran through me as the last bit of chill let go and dissolved. I thought about the dark skies above me, about the shooting stars that might right now be tracing their way through the firmament. In the newspaper, I'd read that they were tiny specks of space dust, burning as they plunged through the upper atmosphere. And for a few moments, I let my mind wonder at the idea of space and far off galaxies and what it might be like to live on a planet with more than one sun, with rings or a different colored sky. The heat in my body brought me back down to earth and I sat up slowly and drank from my water. I could taste the faint hint of citrus and the fresh mint. And though I thought this most every trip to the sauna, I believed I'd never tasted anything as good. I tossed another ladle of water onto the stones and wrapped the towel around me, sitting on the bench and taking slow, relaxed breaths. As a little girl, I'd wished on shooting stars, and I thought a New Year's wish might be better than a resolution. With my robe and slippers on, I stepped out and saw that the skies had cleared, and I took in the wide, dark expanse, when a sudden flash streaked across it. What did I wish for the New Year? I looked up and stood still in the quiet. I wished that the winter would go on and on. Thanks for visiting the Village of Nothing Much with us. We invite you to create useful rituals to enjoy something tasty in the fresh air, and to make a wish on a star. We'll be back next week with more stories. Sweet days to all of you. <laughs>